and welcome to VOA's Red Carpet. I'm your host, Maida de la Salette. On this episode of Red Carpet, we have a short film by a Ghanaian-German filmmaker receiving plenty of attention at film festivals, fashion designers changing narratives in Rwanda, and an interview with Angolan singer Bonga. Let's begin! We begin with the unfortunate news of the passing of fashion designer Virgil Abloh, who has died at the age of 41 after a two-year battle with cancer. Tributes have poured in from celebrities and friends for the leading fashion executive hailed as the Karl Lagerfeld of his generation. Abloh founded his streetwear brand Off-White in 2013. In 2018, he made history as the first black artistic director for Louis Vuitton. We are all shocked after this terrible news. Virgil was not only a genius designer, a visionary, he was also a man with a beautiful soul and great wisdom. Bernard Arnault, chairman and chief executive of Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, shared in a statement. A statement from Abloh's family on the designer's Instagram account said Abloh was diagnosed two years ago with cardiac angiosarcoma, a rare form of cancer in which a tumor occurs in the heart. He chose to battle it privately. Blake Newby, a fashion industry expert, told the Associated Press that the designer's enormous impact on the fashion world will last forever. The reality is that you can't talk about streetwear specifically luxury streetwear without mentioning the name Virgil Abloh. It, it's impossible. Um, his footprint on the fashion industry, you know, is, is absolutely incredible and remarkable. You have to think about it, you know, in the more than 160 years that Louis Vuitton has existed as a fashion house, he was their first Black creative director. Um, that is something that is, you know, that is truly unprecedented. Yeah, you know, and then just talking about Off-White, you know, and the impact that that has had on streetwear, you can't walk down a street anywhere uh, where fashion is prevalent and not see, um, you know, the creations of Virgil Abloh somewhere in your view. Um, and so like, like, you know, this is an impeccable loss, um, you know, for someone who was such a tremendous creative, um, you know, and, and this will be felt, uh, you know, I truly believe for years to come and his impact, well, I truly, I believe will last forever. Drake shared a series of photos with the designer in an Instagram post, writing, and I quote, My plan is to touch the sky a thousand more times for you. Love you eternally, brother. Thank you for everything. End quote. Fellow designer Donatella Versace posted a photo with model Naomi Campbell and Virgil calling him an innovator, a creator for the history books. Abloh is survived by his wife, Shannon Abloh, and his children, Low and Gray. Rwanda's Kigali has not quite reached the heights of Africa's fashion mecca, Lagos, but the capital of the small landlocked nation of 13 million hosts its own trends, which young designers hope will conquer the world. Agence France Press has this story. Rwanda's fashion industry received a helping hand from the government after it hiked import taxes on second-hand clothing from the US and Europe to promote local manufacturers nearly four years ago. Designer Matthew Hugamba, founder of House of Tail, is optimistic about the Rwandan government's support for the industry. There is this excitement with fashion in particular because there's a combination of things. There's, um, there's designers taking initiative, um, but then there's also a, re a receptive government, you know. Um, I think that, you know, everyone talks about the Made in Rwanda policy and, um, and, and things to do with um, the business side of it, um, reducing taxes on, on fabric imports. High-end labels from homegrown talent are flourishing and attitudes are changing. 
Rwandan shoe label Uzuri KNY borrows from the country's weaving traditions to create braided sandals. The brand's co-founder, Izode Shimwe, said young designers like her were keen to change Rwanda's image. Ten years ago, when you Googled Rwanda, you will only see machetes and people killing each other and hungry kids on the streets. So we, um, as designers of, in Rwanda, are also contributing to changing the narratives of Rwanda and, and mostly to, change, to changing how people perceive Rwanda, because we're more than that. Founders like Isolde and Matthew hope to inspire a new generation of designers to rebrand Rwanda as Africa's newest fashion capital. A short film called I Am by Ghanaian-German actor and filmmaker Jerry Hoffman is generating plenty of buzz in the film festival circuit. We spoke with Jerry about the production of his film and his background in cinema. Directed by Jerry Hoffman, shot by Lena Katharina Krauss, and produced by Stella Flicker, I Am is the second project of the German collective following their first internationally acclaimed short, Mall. This unique science fiction short is about the special relationship between a woman and an android. Jerry told us the idea for the film came during the pandemic. And we actually had a total different script. Um, and then the worldwide pandemic opened up and we actually had to change because we had risky people and club scenes. And so the producer, the DP, the author and I came along and we're like, OK, what do we do in these crazy times? What kind of story do we want to tell that really matters to us? And um, yeah, we had the feeling that the we knew it can only be a limited amount of actors, actresses because of the pandemic to have like safety guidance. It was in the beginning. And so we knew the most profound and interesting combination for us was two black women in a forest, in a science fiction movie. Guten Morgen. Frühstück? Following his involvement in several films, such as Hitman, Agent 47, Jerry decided to focus more on the production side and studied directing at the Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles and Hamburg Media School. Having started at such a young age, he feels fortunate to still be involved in film. And I feel like we sometimes come up with a narrative that you only have one purpose and you need to be, when you're five years old, you need to know your purpose and that's your career. And for me, it changed and it was part of this evolution of, um, I love my job, I love acting. The black female-led drama is being recognized in more places than one. It premiered at the SceneQuest Film Festival in San Jose, California, and was nominated for a Student Academy Award at the Oscars. It also won the HBO Max Best Short Film Award at the St. Martha's Vineyard African American Film Festival. <laughs> China has been making patriotic movies for its domestic audiences while tightening control of its film industry. Developments that have left Hollywood wondering whether its movies will still be welcome in China's lucrative market. VOA's Elizabeth Lee has the details. Iris Liu is so passionate about filmmaking that she traveled thousands of miles from her home in China to learn from the masters of this art form. I love film, so I really want to see how a real film goes, and there's no place better than Hollywood. Liu is studying her craft in Los Angeles, home to Hollywood's studios. She sees a big difference between how the U.S. and China treat movies. Liu says Beijing bans Hollywood movies with certain themes, such as self-exploration. Those kind of movies be banned a lot in China. I, I don't know the reason. Probably it's because they try to make everybody think the same. That's why they don't want you to spend too many time to understand yourself. China has been drawing audiences with patriotic films. At the same time, Beijing is cracking down on its entertainment industry in an effort to narrow the gap between the rich and the poor, says veteran Hollywood executive and author Chris Fenton. Hollywood-style business that they had in the local industry there 
was very ostentatious. There was lots of big entourages, lots of flaunting of wealth. And that was creating a lot of animosity among the people that were noticing that stuff. For years, U.S. production companies have been trying to make Beijing-friendly films to gain entry into the lucrative China market. But Hollywood's film presence in China has been steadily decreasing in recent years. China's tighter grip over its entertainment industry may actually be good news for American filmmakers, says Fenton. It's going to allow us hopefully to go back to making the best movies possible without any sort of premeditated censorship and without any kowtowing to the Chinese government. But China is moving away from Hollywood, especially by banning certain kinds of movies. A movie that shows some aspirational quality of democracy. And that aspirational quality of democracy is seen as a threat by the Chinese government. So in a perfect world, they would love to create their own world-class industry that caters to their massive consumer market by itself and not need Hollywood whatsoever. But Liu sees a benefit in exposure to movies made outside China. Watch different movies from different countries is actually a way to understand each other. Just as Liu would like to see Chinese culture better explained in the West through film. Elizabeth Lee, VOA News. Celebrated in France, in Portugal, and other countries in Europe, Angolan musician Bonga is an ambassador for Angolan music and culture. While celebrating 50 years in the business, he looks back at the lessons learned in this interview with VOA's Oscar Medeiros in Lisbon. Angolan singer Bonga celebrated 50 years of his career with two shows in Portugal in Lisbon and in Porto. Songs such as Homem do Saco, Olhos Molhados, or Cacheche are hits of the singer, considered an ambassador of Angolan music, with more than 400 compositions of his authorship, 32 albums, seven movie soundtracks, and a record sale as well. In his journey as a musician, he also conquered several popularity awards and tributes. After so many adventures and sacrifices, well, and some bad things too, I had many collaborations. Many doors opened to me, especially in France, in Paris. I got to do many partnerships, perform in several stages and places, and all of that is a tremendous joy. At the age of 79, the first African gold and platinum record in Portugal considers that it is necessary to promote more Portuguese-speaking music in an African market dominated by music sung in French and English. When we don't show interest for what is ours, and considering that our TV broadcasts in general foreign content, considering that our youth adapts other things other than ours, because they are afraid of tradition, they fear the traditional instruments, and it's complicated. But is it our responsibility? Oh, yes, it is. Let's do it. Bonga, do you think you should also sing in English to be more accepted? No, 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 no. No, no, no. That will be depersonalize what is ours and what I take with me every time when I sing, when I promote. Especially so what's ours shows in the international showbiz. That's all for today. Thanks for watching VOA's Red Carpet. I'm your host, Maida de la Salette. For more on your entertainment news, check us out on www.voanews.com or on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at VOA. Until next time, everyone.